Can I stick my head in? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whoa! <laughs> About a quarter of all the material in a typical skyscraper is there just for resisting moving air. Our world is only getting windier, and it impacts almost every decision in a tower's design. Most people would think that tall buildings are governed from a design and engineering point of view by gravity. That's not true. Most tall buildings are really governed by wind. And we're going to look at the new buildings and meet the architects and engineers working to shape a future that is less driven by fighting the wind. Right behind me, along Lakeshore Drive, here in the Windy City, construction is underway on a set of towers that will be largely invisible to the wind. These towers will experience wind forces that are equivalent to buildings that are just a fraction of their size. It took a combination of advanced tools and testing, but in the end, this level of efficiency, it was achieved through smart decisions around the building's placement, orientation, shape, and details. The architects and engineers that developed those concepts are here at the Chicago office of Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. Hi, my name is Ryan Culligan. I'm a design principal at SOM. I'm Scott Duncan, design partner and architect at SOM. The project just began construction a few months ago, and they will be, when complete, a pair of tall towers at the edge of Lake Michigan. What's under construction right now is phase one, or the North Tower. It will stand almost 900 feet or 275 meters tall once it's complete in 2027. It's being developed by Related Midwest as a mixed-use tower with amenities on the first floor that connects to the Riverwalk and then a new park on the east. Above all that will be 75 stories of affordable and luxury housing with balconies at the top that look out across the city and Lake Michigan. But landing on this exceedingly efficient design took a lot of ingenuity. We understand intuitively how buildings might perform. But for the next level of precision and for confirming our intuitions, we really need tools. The computational fluid dynamics CFD simulations for wind are quite good, but they still don't have the level of precision that we see in an actual wind tunnel. That's why they have a wind tunnel right in their office to test the performance of their tower designs. I'll throw it on and then at the speed that we normally run the test at, you guys can tell me if it's too loud or my name is Brad Young. I'm a senior structural engineer here in the Chicago office of SOM. Myself, along with a couple others, run our experimental wind tunnel laboratory. The model here sits on this aluminum base plate. Below this aluminum base plate is essentially a very high sensitivity strain gauge. We can measure shear that the, that the wind imposes on the building and overturning moments as well in multiple directions. We have uh, surface roughness features, uh, very technically <laughs> white Lego blocks Legos. <laughs> um, that create a bit of the uh, near ground turbulence. All the measurements from the high sensitivity strain gauge um, get run through a data acquisition to our computer. And so we can get a sense of the actual full scale estimates of the base overturning moment. And as I mentioned, even the expected motion of the building that the occupants may perceive. These tools help the entire team thoroughly understand how wind passes over this piece of land, and they were able to predict how the flow of that wind will change once the towers are put there. In this case, the, the tapering that you see is a result of the uh, wind performance and, and taking that analysis from the wind tunnel and using it as a basis for form making. So form follows function, and that's true in this case. Wind here mostly comes from the south. It travels up the shore of Lake Michigan, and it points right at the site, which juts out into the water along the north edge of the river. The river comes along, and that's an opening in what is otherwise a pretty dense, textured urban environment that helps block the wind. So we get a lot of wind that kind of sneaks through, comes up along the river, and directly into the building, which is why wind becomes such a driver for this particular site in the city. But the model that you see here of 400 North Lakeshore is not the first one that they started with. It took quite a few tries learning from each step along the way. This three different schemes mark very important milestones in understanding the way that our design uh, worked with the wind. The first on the left shows a coarser stepping, fewer steps, in which we kind of knew that at this location, a truly extruded building was not going to work. It was gonna to cost too much, it was gonna to have too much carbon in it. One of the things that we found though, even still with this level of stepping, was that the amount of movement at the top of the building was just too much. And so we tested another version that was of equal area. For those of you that have taken calculus, this is the same curve that just steps more times. 
right? So there's those additional steps did a lot to drive down the movement of the building, and so also drive down the quantities of the building. You'll see that between this scheme and this scheme, we also added small bays, windows, on the broad sides of the building that helped to confuse the wind. Those two measures, the more steps in those bays, were huge steps forward in, in optimizing the profile of this design uh, for the, the building. The next iteration though, which really dialed in and ultimately landed on the design that's going to be built is to shear the steps that are on the broad faces of the building. So if I look at these models over here, one of the big differences that you'll notice between this design and this design isn't that there are more steps from one side to the other, really. It's that they've been cleaved apart on the short faces of the building so that you have a smaller step that is then staggered with the next one. You'll also notice there are several steps on this design that are aligned and shifting them so that they are misaligned. You know, if I hold this profile here, you'll see that the steps on each edge are misaligned and that allowed for the wind to be confused to a higher degree on this scheme versus the others. Our engineers talk to us about wanting to confuse the wind to avoid a lot of buildup of organized wind forces along one edge of the tower. Probably the, the most important thing you can do is create variation in the shape of the building along the height. Once you can introduce some variability in the tower height, a vortice that's forming at say mid height of the tower will be will have a different frequency and a different magnitude than a vortice forming somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so they sort of cancel each other out. It's not unlike the dimples on a golf ball that allow the golf ball to fly that much farther, uh, but it's kind of in reverse. We want, of course, the, the building to uh, remain in place and, and not be subject to those excessive wind forces. Highly functional considerations. We like to think that there's poetry in that if it's done correctly. All the towers around here have to deal with tremendous wind forces. Each one does that in their own distinct way. Across the river, for instance, the St. Regis Tower has what's known as pass-through floors towards the top. That's what those open floors are called, which are there to allow the wind to travel through the building instead of around it. This helps relieve the overall forces acting on the building, but it comes at a price. That area, if enclosed and turned into condos, would be worth about $20 million. In total, for any average skyscraper, about 20% of its overall cost goes directly or indirectly to aspects of the design that combat wind. That sounds incredible, but think about it. That St. Regis Tower, even with the pass-through floor, experiences the equivalent of 290 Boeing 777 jets pushing on it at full throttle, trying to tip it over. Those imaginary Boeing 777s are pushing in a way that makes one side of the building heavier, while the other side is trying to lift up off the ground. So sometimes the foundation is actually pulling the building down that's on the side that's facing the wind instead of holding it up. It's absolutely crazy these towers make a positive contribution as prominent newcomers to the Chicago skyline as a whole. A master composition that this firm, SOM, has had a heavy hand in shaping over the years. From the Hancock to the north, to the Willis Tower to the south, and a bunch of towers in between, each unique design is a snapshot in time. And when we compare them, we can trace the shifting technologies and the attitudes around how towers relate to the natural world. You could say it's tapering. It's tapering, it's just, uh, it's like the Minecraft version of tapering or something, it ste steps in like, like Legos. Tools like wind tunnels, coupled with nuanced strategies for how buildings can work with nature instead of against it, will allow us to conceive and create towers that are more resilient in the end, while also being less costly, both financially and less costly to the environment. For instance, in the days of the Hancock and Sears Towers, the thought was that we should seal off buildings with inoperable windows and then provide robust air conditioning systems. This was the only way to keep occupants and the building comfortable year round. But today, we might allow natural breezes through a tower. We have the precise knowledge for how to manage it now, and it's much better strategy in the end. Another way of thinking about wind entirely is embracing it. You want your building to breathe. You want, you want to have the ability to open the windows and uh, avoid paying for air conditioning and the electricity that comes with that. So this is a building. It takes an opposite approach. It's very porous. There are a lot of terraces. Every window is, is operable. Every facade wow. is operable. And the wind is not just kind of going through laterally, but it's, it's moving vertically. There's a lot more than meets the eye and many ways to kind of respond wow. to wind. 
Finally, what if the building actually harnesses the wind to do work and provide energy? That's the goal of the Pearl River Tower in Gangzhou, China, which channels the wind into four discrete tunnels. Each contains a wind turbine that generates electricity. This configuration is 15 times more efficient than a typical wind turbine that's just left out in the open. Because the building is shaped specifically to control the flow of air, its motion is predictable to the point where it can be grabbed on every floor and channeled through a ventilation system inside of the ceilings and in the floors. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think this looks more like what one would expect a tower that was designed with aerodynamics kind of at the forefront of it. Would, would look, it's all about wind. What I think is the next level for, for buildings, and particularly if we're thinking about reducing our carbon footprint in, in tall buildings, uh, is threading the needle of solving for wind, solving for energy generation, solving for natural ventilation. And what does that look like? What, it, what is that animal? With wind being such a huge factor that's driving costs, material, and energy use, even small improvements can yield large-scale results. Airflow can be simulated in the computer, but there's just so many variables in the real world that are at play. They're just unpredictable, so physical testing is still necessary to fine-tune everything. In the industry, there's an understanding that computational fluid dynamics may one day supplant the physical test. It's just not able to do that right now. And when seen all together, this physical testing in the wind tunnel has revolutionized the way that we build today. Buildings have all sorts of small and precisely calibrated elements that you might not immediately recognize for how and why they work. Just like modern F1 cars with all their canards and active aero, these components on buildings help channel airflow or maybe they disrupt it to confuse the air. In F1, wind tunnel testing began in the 1990s and contributed to a 15% decrease in lap times. For buildings, maybe coincidentally, some estimates put us at a similar 15% improvement that has come from wind tunnel testing, which began in the 1960s. The first buildings to be tested in a wind tunnel were the original World Trade Center towers. Today, it's estimated that we can build 15% taller and cheaper due to wind tunnel testing alone. But of course, the real value of this work isn't really about building taller and saving money just on the world's tallest buildings. Just like innovation in F1 trickles into the engineering of everyday products, my hope is that the research from projects like 400 North Lakeshore will go to the benefit of everyone by figuring out innovative ways to build in harmony with the context, by reusing foundations and mitigating those pesky wind forces, it's doing its part to make Chicago, and anywhere else for that matter, more livable, sustainable, resilient, and well-designed overall. And Scott, Brad, and Ryan have ideas about that too, which you'll find in their extended interview available right now on the streaming platform Nebula. Those three show us the ins and outs of the wind tunnel. They talk about some more amazing models and even share more wind reduction strategies. And I love to be able to make videos like this available to you, and Nebula is the reason that I'm able to do it. It's a creator-owned platform for video and podcasts. While you're there, you'll find a ton more exclusive content of mine, like the tour that I got of the unit of Marina City. In addition to the content that you won't find anywhere else, it's also where I post my regular videos up before they're available on YouTube. Over 150 of your favorite creators are already on Nebula, all with exclusive and early content. Sam at Wendover Productions, Real Engineering, Not Just Bikes, City Beautiful, and many more of the folks that you watch are helping to build Nebula into a premier destination for educational creators. From cities to space to politics and geography, Nebula has it covered and presented in an exciting new layout. There's also a brand new news section and a lineup of new Nebula originals. Those are commissioned series like Real Life Lore's Modern Conflicts or City Beautiful's Deep Dives and how each of the world's greatest cities came to be. One of my favorite recent ones is Neo's Underexposure, which just went through the intricacies of the Bin Laden raid. It is so good. You can gain access to this world of amazing content simply by clicking on the link on the screen, and it's also listed at the top of the description. From there, you can sign up for whatever way you'd like. The most economical is to choose the $2.50 option when you sign up for a year. Or if you really value this channel and want to show your absolute maximum amount of support, you can choose the lifetime option. That's like the angel investor tier, which I always appreciate. Either way, though, you'll be able to unlock the entire catalog of treasures of your favorite YouTubers, all the while you'll directly be supporting this channel and me to be able to share my takes on the buildings that structure our world. See you over there, and as always, thanks for watching.